We are going to be uh, going on to our next panel session, uh, which is upcoming uh, shortly in about three minutes at two o'clock Eastern, which is popular and emerging use cases for interoperability. Uh, before we do that, though, uh, we're going to just have a, a, a brief video um, from uh, Secure Exchange Solutions. Welcome to Secure Exchange Solutions, a Centauri Health Solutions company. The leading provider of cloud-based clinical data exchange. As a pioneer in standards-based exchange, our clinical exchange technologies support hospitals and health systems, physicians and specialty care providers, government and commercial health plans, long-term care and skilled nursing facilities, and behavioral health and pharmacies. As the largest nationwide independent provider of clinical data exchange services, we have over 500,000 direct digital exchange endpoints registered on our network across 110,000 provider organizations, integrations with more than 100 healthcare technology partners and more than 40 health information exchanges, with easy access to the 2.8 million member direct trust community. SES is a fully accredited health information service provider, providing complete end-to-end -end message encryption, comprehensive reporting, seamless integrations and robust directory services. Through SES Direct, clinicians and administrators benefit from the maximum level of data security, connectivity, and network reach. SES Notify is a real-time health event notifications platform that engages and informs physicians and care management teams of critical information to improve patient outcomes, streamline referrals, and reduce unnecessary hospital readmissions. SES Fetch captures clinical data and reduces provider abrasion while accelerating the discovery and analysis of potential diagnosis and documentation gaps in the provider workflow. Sharing clinical information with providers closes critical care gaps and helps build a complete patient picture, improving outcomes while ensuring appropriate reimbursement. SES Notify reaches more than 80% of U.S. providers and is used to streamline delivery of actionable clinical data to primary care physicians to close gaps and help ensure that patients receive the care they deserve. Our payer and provider collaboration used SES Real-Time Health Event Alerts at the point of care to reduce administrative burden and yield a 50% decrease in hospital readmissions, resulting in significant cost savings. A global health system partner realized an 88% improvement in referral processing times by using an automated closed-loop referral process to improve home care coordination. Their infectious diseases team leverages the same notification technology to prevent costly 30-day readmissions. Secure Exchange Solutions is committed to the success of our customers. Our mission is to leverage standards-based exchange to optimize workflows, engage providers, and deliver actionable information that improves healthcare. Contact us for a free interoperability assessment. Get connected now. And now if you could, please take a few seconds to read the bios of our moderator and panelists. Awesome. Thank you, Carol, so much. And I'm excited to now dive even further into interoperability topics specifically related to use cases of interoperability. So, so far today, we've heard about AI, we've heard about data quality and usability, and then patient identity and matching. And thinking about where it all comes back to, what we're trying to achieve. Um, certainly we are trying to help data flow seamlessly and, and be used. Uh, so that's what you're gonna hear from this panel. Now you're going to hear about popular and emerging use cases in interoperability. So I am joined today by uh, Michelle Darnell, president of Secure Exchange Solutions and Adam Russell, VP of Strategy and Partnerships at Healthy.io, and Ann Santifer, Executive Director of uh, OHIT, or Arkansas Share, um, as we refer to them. So before we dive into the conversation today, I just want to take a moment to, to level set. So there's a lot 
happening in interoperability. There's a lot happening in healthcare technology too. And one of the hottest topics of the year and acronyms that you've heard throughout today is, is TEFCA. Uh, we're certainly looking forward to the Office of the National Coordinators annual meeting next week. I believe in-person registration is closed, but um, they have announced that they are streaming information about TEFCA and announcing the first QHINs. So we're going to leave that conversation to them. So <laughs> if you're not registered, go out and register to watch that next week. Um, but there's a lot of other stuff happening in interoperability that's complementary to TEFCA. And so I'm excited to dig into that conversation a little bit more today. So to kick it off, I'm interested in knowing what's one particular use case, if you have to really kind of narrow it down to one, um, what's one particular use case that you'd like to highlight today to this audience and share more information about? So, Michelle, I want to start with you. Can you can you give us a little bit more about what you're thinking about and the the one use case that you'd like to highlight? Okay, Catherine, that's a tough challenge because there's so many to cover. So, um, but um, I'll I'll try to I'll try to limit it to one. Um, so just a, a little bit of background uh, in my role at Secure Exchange Solutions, um, I have played a part in sort of the growth of the company as we have uh, integrated into many, many different workflows. Um, our customer base is, um, we closely align with all types of customers and end users uh, were integrated into our HIE partners and their workflows or integrated into EHR and HIT application workflows of all types. And so that gives us a, a great perspective into a wide variety of use cases, um, which we should share more of. <laughs> There's not enough time to share them all. But the one that really, I think, I'm um, very excited about and is a is a recent one that was highlighted by uh, class research and it was awarded the class research K2 peak award for provi uh, provider and payer collaboration and innovation. And so that use case was really all about solving some um, gaps in communication for gaps in care for primary care physicians. And the award was um, really uh, about the work that had been done by providers, primary care physicians in the state of Alabama, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama and Secure Exchange Solutions. And it, um, the use case focused on providing near-time information, reducing friction with providers, aligning the goals across providers and payers and the patient. And um, that is really, uh, it, it kind of sums it up nicely, but in terms of what the use case is about, it's about providing uh, key health event alerts that are near real time in the provider's EMR workflow. This is data, you know, the primary care provider is critical in the whole patient care. They, but when care is provided outside of their office, they're often left outside of the communication loop. So that was kind of a story in partnership with the primary care providers that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama had heard a lot about. And so this use case focused on getting that real-time information to the primary care provider on care that was provided outside of their office in a place that could be actionable in their EMR workflow. Um, it demonstrated some very impactful results, such as um, for high-risk patients, reducing their uh, ED and you know, readmissions and the costs associated with that, and brought a lot of administrative, I think sort of un, maybe not necessarily planned for administrative efficiencies because it helped in terms of burden on trying to, you know, get this information into their EMR system in other ways, like in manual ways. So that one is one that comes to mind that I'm, you know, it's it uh, was very uh, innovative and had real results and surveyed results from the provider community. There are many more. We so we see so many cool things that are tied to all kinds of critical workflows um, that go beyond transitions of care 
tied to value-based care, reimbursement, medication management, quality and performance, um, also to um, what I'm really interested for the audience to hear what Adam's going to chat about because that all ties to, I think, some um, new frontiers for all of us. And so um, lots of neat things. If we can set up a webinar of maybe seven or eight hours, we could get through all of those. But uh, <laughs> That's that's certainly true. I mean, I you know I don't know how I would pick one. It's so interesting to me. You know, we started out with this, um, like the key uh, use case of referrals and how much we've expanded since then. And I think sometimes we don't give ourselves enough credit for the additional use cases that are happening in the time that they're happening in. So um, reducing friction and and having real time communication is certainly so key. So thank you for sharing that. Michelle and Adam, I'm interested from you. So if you had to pick one, one use case for interoperability, what, what would you highlight? Yeah, thanks, Catherine and Michelle. Um, appreciate the, the tea up there. So nice to be part of this panel. Um, you introduced me briefly at this, the start, but just for way of background, uh, I lead partnerships and strategy at a company called Healthy IO. And what we're focused on is enabling the smartphone device um, to be clinical grade. And the way we productize that is using the smartphone camera to enable in-home testing for chronic kidney disease. And so the, 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 the item on interoperability I want to talk to you today is specifically about enabling individuals to conduct a clinical grade uh, kidney screening test from home, but, but it's applicable across a whole function of different in-home, whether it be testing use cases, uh, monitoring use cases or, or other data that's collected outside of the typical um, in-office visits or visits you're having with uh, you know their kind of broader care team. Um, and so, yeah, by by way of the, the background, so we we enable the process that um, effectively turns the camera into the lab testing device. And the reason why we focused in on that so much with respect, respect to chronic kidney disease, it's a, it's a condition that is highly under identified and highly under diagnosed because it relies on individuals to go to their primary care provider and perform multiple tests, one of which is a urine based test and is very difficult to administer at point of care because someone doesn't always have to go to the bathroom in the same way to do that blood can be drawn at any point in time. And so we developed a process that enables someone at clinical grade to conduct this test at home using their smartphone camera and to change the entire paradigm of the 90% of people that have CKD being undiagnosed and unaware of their condition. What's really important and perhaps most important to that entire process is ensuring that the test that is done in the home is delivered back into the clinical record and back to that individual's primary care provider. Because a, te a diagnostic test in and of itself is not valuable unless the physician is reading it, uh, performing additional follow-up as needed, diagnosing and managing that patient. And so early on in our commercialization follow following the FDA clearance we received last year, we developed a partnership with Secure Exchange Solutions to figure out the best way to get our test result, which is not a new biomarker, it's an existing test, which is done into the home, into the clinical workflow in the appropriate way. Uh, and we, we have now enabled that. We've turned this on live now, working with many peers and provider systems, um, using direct secure messaging to get our result, not just to the provider in a meaningful way, but in a actionable, machine readable way into the clinical lab result, which, which helps that provider when that individual is empowered to come back into care to talk about their kidney health. They're not saying, hey, I did a test at home and here's my result on my phone and a repeat test is done and, or the visit is needed. And, you know, it just it just doesn't help. And so getting the results of the provider in a meaningful, actionable way that aligns to their care for continuity is what we were really focused in. And again, I think a, a novel um, approach to something that's going to extend across healthcare um, broadly in the years ahead, this this idea of in-home testing and doing what we've learned from the COVID pandemic and, and what antigen tests and realization that people can do these things at home, but doing it in a way that is coordinated and structured with the rest of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that, Adam. And I, I what I love about the story that you just shared is taking a, a problem and then figuring out what existing pieces exist and how 
to make that work to to solve the problem. So not necessarily inventing um, new things for interoperability, but looking at what exists for interoperability and how you can make that data actionable. So uh, thank you for for sharing that. That's really neat to hear. And um, so, so far we've heard about payers, we've heard about involving patients and getting that information back to the clinicians. And so Anne, when you think about use cases for, for interop, is there one particular use case that you'd like to highlight? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. So I had the pleasure of overseeing provider engagement for Arkansas Medicaid for many years. So I always try to think of things that we can use data for to really reduce that burden on our provider community to, of having to provide charts and documents to health plans or public health. So I'm going to pick risk adjustment chart retrieval. It is a huge component of health plans, um, Medicare Advantage plans, and um, you know we have the data. We've always had the data here at SHARE, but just because we have the data doesn't mean it's going to be useful or actionable for the health plan to use it for risk adjustment. Uh, but we've made some really great progress. We've you know partnered with some third-party companies to help us um, take that piece of data um, and um, I'll mention SCS is involved, take that piece of data and present it to the health plan in a way that they are comfortable and used to. So we have CCDs here at SHARE, but you know when we were trying to work with our health plans to help meet that or maybe reduce the amount of chart retrievals that they were doing, they really did not like the format. So it took a lot of work um, from us and and SES to create a chart that's useful to the health plan that's not gonna disrupt their current processes because nobody likes change. But the data is here, it's available, it can meet those, uh, those risk adjustment requirements. So it's really been great to watch you know, how different health plans have taken this approach here in Arkansas, but together they're all working towards reducing payer uh, provider burden by utilizing the technology that we have available and the data that we have available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Anne. And I think many of us believe and hope that interoperability and technology can reduce cost of care and can increase quality of care. So it's it's wonderful to hear about the other use cases and, and the ways that we're using this data and how it can be actionable, because hopefully that does lead to us achieving the quadruple aim. Um, so you all have mentioned different types of stakeholders, and I want to dig a little bit deeper because I think typically when we think of interoperability, the first stakeholder that we think about is not actually the patient, it's the clinician. Unfortunately, it's not the patient, it should be. But when we think about kind of the spectrum of stakeholders and all of the, the stakeholders that should be involved in interoperability, you've described some. Can you can you give additional stakeholders and additional people that we should be pulling into these use cases and we should be thinking about? So Michelle, I'd love to start with you. Yeah, I think the, um, you're, you're, you just reminded me of uh, a point that I failed to make on the on the use case, which is so in terms we touch a lot of stakeholders that are um, generally considered to be, I guess, you know, last mile, maybe don't don't have access or maybe don't have a system that has access. But the patient, the consumer is the real the real stakeholder. Right. And so. I failed to mention that we we integrate into a number of applications that are patient consumer facing. So in essence, you know, the patient consumer is getting access or delivering information. And behind the scenes, we we are a part of that, you know, sort of delivery process, but it's important because it's serving all, all of us, like the patient and the consumer, right? Um, but beyond that, we see, uh, and I think this is all still growing. And as we think about use cases, like the one that Ann mentioned and that Adam mentioned, that that the um, sort of the ecosystem gets larger and larger and larger. Um, but you know, I've seen connection to mobile nurses, to hospice, to um, skilled nursing centers to caregivers that are, you know, maybe partnered with a provider to look out after the patient consumer. 
Um, as we move into, especially we do a lot of work in Medicaid, um, there's also community health services. That includes, that goes beyond the health service provider to include Meals on Wheels, you know, transport, um, health, um, home and housing and behavioral health. Um, but it, it, I, I expect that the ecosystem will just get larger and larger, you know, especially as we have adjacencies like testing that Adam mentioned. So kind yeah, of exciting when you think about it. It is, it is. I think, you know, you think about the the ripple effect and the concentric circles and interoperability just keeps getting bigger and how wonderful that is. That can be, you know, hugely positive for um, so many people. So thank you for sharing that perspective, Michelle. And, and Anne, I'm curious, what about you? What about additional stakeholders who should be involved in interop? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to piggyback on Michelle's comment, actually, because I think, you know, folks are getting care in places that are outside your traditional medical setting. Uh, telehealth had a huge boom during COVID, and now it's here to stay. And being in a rural state um, like Arkansas, telemedicine is very important because we can, we do not have specialty providers throughout the whole state. So being able to collect that information and aggregate it, you know, make it part of the patient's chart, share that information back with the primary care physician. Right now, folks are going out getting telemedicine care, but that information is not being shared uh, with, the, with the care team. Um, and another one I, I want to highlight is social determinants of health. It plays a huge part on, on the patient's outcomes. Uh, we've made decisions here in Arkansas to connect to organizations that are screening folks for social determinants of health, sharing that information back with the primary care physicians, because what we learned um, here in Arkansas is providers want to help folks, and they want to make sure they have all their needs met, but they don't often have the resources, the tool, the time, the staff to be able to do this. So relying on third-party companies that can do some of these social screenings, um, help with the care coordination, help meet those, um, you know, needs that their, their patients have, but then sharing that information back to the providers. So then they are well aware um, that, you know, what their patients' needs are. If you can see that somebody, you know, doesn't have consistent electricity or access to a refrigerator, you may need to change your prescribing patterns to make sure you're not prescribing them anything that needs to be um, in the fridge. Thank you, Anne. And, and, I, I love what you shared too, because thinking about all the different people who can be involved and, and I'm wearing, you can't fully see it, but I'm wearing my team interop shirt today because interoperability is a team sport, right? It requires multiple people, organizations to be involved. So uh, thank you for sharing that perspective. And Adam, what additional stakeholders need to be involved from your perspective in interoperability? Yeah, thanks. Look, I would say every stakeholder has to be involved in interoperability. If it's not top of their list, it should certainly be up there. The, the world is getting noisier and noisier, and there's more and more data out there in every single industry, and healthcare is obviously one of those. The bad thing is this: the data can be good, it can be structured, it can be unstructured, it can be helpful, it can be unhelpful, it can be at the right moment or the wrong moment, right? And um, yeah, the physician can't be the one that has to figure that out. And they can't be chasing multiple sources or getting data from patient re reported information during that point in time and trying to squeeze all this into a, a very short point in time when we already know there's PCP burnout and, and aberration and such going on. Um, I'd say one of the biggest challenges is probably the industry I sit in, which is, I'll call it healthcare tech. Um, too, too many companies I think are out there doing very novel, innovative things in healthcare that exists in their silo and the data is going back to their care team and their care team is trying to manage that patient between office visits and then not feeding much back to the provider. And I think that's a, it's a huge miss for the patient and, and the entire ecosystem. I was actually on a panel um, a couple of weeks ago and I'm going to read you the question that was posed. It was, what have you seen as some of the key challenges across your populations in using in-home devices and smartphone-based solutions? And, and I think if you asked that question five years ago, the answer would be things like people don't have a smartphone or people don't have bandwidth or they don't know how to Bluetooth pair devices. Over 50% said data connection back to the ecosystem. So I, I think that is now the, the 
part of the world in which we're in and making sure that data comes back. And it's why we at Healthy have been so focused on that. And then you think about all these trends that are happening in generative AI and machine learning. None of that works if you if you have bad data or no data. And so I think it's just paramount that, that we have good connectivity in the data and that it's meaningful and actionable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's part of why we started today with data usability and quality is because that truly is the foundation to be able to share this information um, across systems and across disparate entities and stakeholders and really make it work. So thank you for that perspective. And, and I want to pull on this thread a little bit more because we've talked about you know, these different types of stakeholders and that interoperability is getting bigger where we have more use cases, we're doing more. But I want to come back to a moment, um, Adam, you mentioned PCP burnout and, and provider and clinician engagement and uh, and data being usable and actionable. And so I want to go there for a moment. So um, thinking about provider engagement and interoperability, how do we do this better? Have you seen good examples of provider engagement? And when and when clinician engagement and, and interoperability for clinicians, when it works well, can you describe what that looked like, Michelle? Have you seen anything like that? Well, I'll um, I'll go back to the innovation and collaboration between providers and payers, and so that's in in particular been a place that if the wrong data, like to uh, engage the provider you better bring something to the table, right? It needs to be the right data, um, data that perhaps they don't already have and present it in a way that they can that they can take action on. That means it needs to be in their daily workflow. So, you know, first and foremost, um, when we think about like engaging the provider, we think about what what is it? Um, what kind of data is this? You know, unique and different. Is it presented in a way that they can that it actually flows in their you know patient work workflow? Because otherwise, it's it's not you know it won't engage them. There's too much data flowing, right? So I think that's sort of first and foremost what we see with our customers and partners in terms of you know what they're focused on for provider engagement. Also, um, you know, incentives help. And I mean, early on, there were incentives for providers to just kind of get on the grid. That's great. Um, We see continued incentives in contracts between parties, uh, especially, you know, payers and providers for increased reimbursement as a part of being like engaged in, in, you know, interoperability. I think that that uh, continues to be important um, for engaging providers. And um, we mentioned provider fatigue a few times. That really just means uh, it's great that there's more data available. You know, interoperability is growing. There'll be even more data available. So we need to be all, you know, tuned into really provider for fatigue and what's useful and what's not useful and ensuring that only the right data for the use case, you know, get shared. And I, I've really kind of focused on the provider, but it, the same would apply for, you know, different stakeholders depending upon what their interest levels were. So we started with sharing. Now we need to think about the right data at the right time for the use case. And Michelle, I think tying back to some of your earlier comments too about the last mile, one thing that that strikes me is that, you know, we saw incentives through meaningful use and other similar programs, but a lot of um, what we now consider the last mile and providers who haven't been connected, they haven't had the opportunity necessarily for those incentives. So I, it's interesting to me to hear you talk about um, some of the contracts and other things to have incentives. So that's good. So if it's not coming necessarily from a government type of incentive, there are other market forces and uh, market incentives that are happening out there as well, correct? Right. And also, you know, ensuring that, and this has been our focus really on tightly integrating with application partners because they're solving their, you know, they day in and day out, they're solving the problems of the provider, the patient, the consumer, the testing facility, the specialty pharmacy, and that if we can, you know, open up the doors for interoperability through all of those applications, then that sort of ties 
I mean, that's not an, that's not a financial incentive, but it ties to action, right? Because it's in whatever the workflow that the you know participant is operating in, and that's kind of key. Mm -hmm. um, but I I so it's a little bit different category as an incentive, but it actually flows into whatever it is they're doing daily, and this it should just be a part of it, right? So right, yeah, and and so I think thinking about this and, and workflow and something that they're doing daily. So, Anne, as a state HIE, you're working with clinicians and providers day in and day out and responding to their needs. And I know from knowing you and your team personally that that you do a lot of engagement, that you're constantly working with um, clinicians and providers and care teams. So can you talk a little bit more about the engagement and what you've seen work well from your perspective? Yeah. Yeah. I think, and you know, Catherine, I think you made this comment that technology is not the barrier it, for adoption, you know, it's education. So constantly educating our providers, having someone that can hold their hand sometimes to help them understand the information that's being presented to them and helping them apply the information that's being given to them to their workflows. And, you know, ever, I think most people know Justin that works on my team and he is great at that. He will go to the office, he will help our providers apply that information to their day-to-day, -day, into their workflows. But the, the superstars uh, in, our, in our state are those providers that are really using care coordination because our doctors have a lot to do. They're tight for time. Um, using care coordination to help providers do pre-visit planning, to do transitions of care visits you know, and calls and visits, that is all part of that, that ecosystem that's in improving the provider's engagement because the doctor's only getting what they need to know, right? And then sharing that information with our community has to be a fine art. You don't want to give them too much where they're starting to um, disengage, but you want to give them just enough to keep them engaged using the support of their care coordination team and then holding their hands when we have to, you know, and then also giving them data at their comfort level because providers are in different stages of comfort level with data and technology. So providing them with what they just feel comfortable with and then building up from there. Thank you, Anne. And, and Adam, you mentioned this earlier in your earlier comments about how important it is that um, users of Healthy get that information back to the clinician. So from your perspective, and from Healthy's perspective, what have you seen work well with clinician and provider engagement for furthering interoperability? Yeah, thanks. And Michelle and Anne, I completely agree with all the points that were raised about getting data to the provider that's actionable and meaningful and not overwhelming, um, again, because of the short period of time they have to care for their patients during the visit. The, the way I see things from the, I'm going to kind of simplify it a little bit here, but you know, driving value to the provider in, in kind of three ways or three phases. Um, one would be the last thing any patient wants to do or probably the provider wants to do is when they're onboarding a new patient or having a patient back in they haven't seen for quite some period of time is repeat old information. By that, I mean, have you had your Hep B vaccine? Have you been double shot for COVID? Have you had any surgeries in the last, like, that's foundational, right? Like if, if we can solve that like everywhere, like that would be terrific and drive interoperability such that the patient has doesn't have to look at their own charts from their PCP 10 years ago to remember when they got their vaccination, right? Then I think phase two, which is where I think healthy fits in is where a lot of the ecosystem fits in right now, which is enabling the provider in things like gaps in care closure and ensuring that, um, you know, they, they had a test done in a different place or or they had a different visit at another point in time that flagged something that wasn't necessarily closed. And that data is helping the provider uh, highlight a condition they may have that the patient, the provider may be unaware of that they can better treat and manage and slow the progression of that disease, keep costs down, help the provider share in risk adjustment by diagnosing things correctly, coding and, and all the kind of regulatory and kind of things around that realm. And then the third, which I think the industry is trying to get to, and there's certainly some technologies out there today that enable this, is taking all of that um, clinical history and other information from point of care devices and in-home devices, et cetera, to kind of predict, right? Like when I drive my car, I get a warning light 
that my oil level is low, right? Like the provider at hopefully in the short term, medium term can get warning lights as to things that may happen to that patient based on all these factors, including genome sequencing and all those things that get very sophisticated very quickly. And that's kind of, to me, like the next frontier of, of data and, and using everything we have in an interoper interoperable way to kind of predict the future and become more proactive versus preventative in, uh, in someone's or preventative versus reactive in their healthcare. And that's also part of why we started today with the conversation around AI. I mean, I think it remains to be seen what the future does look like. But to your point, thinking about how we can in the future decrease cost and, and use further use interoperability as a tool, it's exciting. It's exciting to think about and it's exciting to think about the positive impacts um, that we may see. But still, obviously, a lot remains unseen and unknown at this point. So thank you for that that perspective. And um, you know, one thread that I've heard all of you mention is making sure that data is usable, that it's actionable. It's the right data at the right time. And so for the attendees today who maybe are in various stages or experiences with interoperability, I'm curious if you could share um, from your perspective, what steps would you take to, to take this panel today and make it actionable for them? So what steps would you um, recommend to enhance their interoperability use cases and, and what they're doing today and grow how they're using interoperability? So, Anne, I'll start with you this time. What do you, what do you think first steps are? What would you recommend to attendees today? I would recommend listening to their community because I think every state, every community is different. So listening to your community providers, you know, or stakeholders, what are your pain points? And then thinking about, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you know, how can you utilize existing products or things you already have in place to meet or alleviate some of those pain points, right? So for example, for us, we leveraged our encounter notification services to support our traumatic brain injury um, registry. So our health department tracks folks after they have a traumatic brain injury. We have this encounter notification services that we notify providers when their patients have hospitalization. We can use that same, infer uh, that same process to notify our traumatic brain injury um, registry when somebody who what had previous uh, TBI previously have been in the hospital again. So it's not about reinventing the wheel. It's really about listening and then figuring out what's the fastest, you know, cheapest way to help alleviate some of those pain points. I, I think sometimes we overcomplicate things too. And so really, truly, I love that advice of just starting by listening. What do people need? What will they use? Um, and certainly, you know, regulation and legislation talk and that becomes a need. But just like you highlighted, there are other opportunities, you know, low hanging fruit um, community needs that we can solve with the building blocks that we have. So, Adam, I'm curious from your perspective, any actionable next steps that that you would share with the audience today? I agree. Define the problem that you're trying to solve. Don't go chase the next shiny thing because everyone's talking about it. I feel like we did that with Bitcoin and everyone tried Bitcoin pilots and nothing really happened. Like, like fundamentally, what is the problems within your provider system or payer or community health system, like whatever it might be. And I guarantee you there are solutions out there that can help and, and ways in which you can start in a kind of crawl, walk, run type approach before investing, you know, tens of millions of dollars in a multi-year program, kind of test things out and go from there. Thanks, Adam. And uh, Michelle, any any additional thoughts? Yeah, I we um, I always just think like look around because it is a um, we spend a lot of time and we all we all of us on this call have responsibility because we're all steeped in this you know particular area of expertise. Um, we have a responsibility, I think, to educate and even if folks look around, you know, we're all seeking the universal solution to streamline this, but in the meantime. There is so much that's already been built out and that's available. And I think of like our partnerships with HIEs, you know, Anne's group, if a um, either an integrated partner or a plan comes to us and says, hey, you know, we need this data, but 
it's missing data from these providers or it's like the data quality is not quite there. Our first, um, really our first go get is talk to your local, you know, your state, your regional, your national HIE, work with them. They have all the trusted relationships with the parties on the ground, work with them. They will get and improve the, you know, they will go and get the additional data that's needed for whatever the use case is. So, you know, look at what's available, work with your, you know, regional and state and HIEs if they are available to you. And, you know, really think about, uh, to Adam's point and Anne's point, really think about the problem and make sure that you are um, solving that problem and not kind of over solving the problem, right? So that would be quick three. In, in a moment, I want to wrap up with any final thoughts or words of wisdom that you all might have, but I want to add on to what you're saying, Michelle, first. So from a direct trust perspective, I think one of the things that we hear too from the community a lot um, is a disconnect between what clinicians and provider organizations and care teams um how they get access to interoperability or sometimes not knowing what's available to them, that they have these things available and maybe their settings aren't configured correctly. So I think my uh, advice to the attendees here today would be if you're a user of a technology platform, a user of an electronic health record uh, or anything similar, that you really investigate what's what's available to you. And you know we've heard throughout today Things are constantly changing. We know from our phones, our smartphones, that we get updates and new things are enabled all the time and interoperability is moving just as fast. So I think my uh, two cents would be if you haven't had a conversation with your technology partners or your EHRs recently or anyone else, that you do that, that you have that conversation and make sure that you are set up for success, that you have um, those settings or capabilities enabled that you have access to today, but maybe just not on. Um, so with that, with our last couple of minutes, I just want to ask any final thoughts, words of wisdom, I'll, I'll open it up to you all to share if you have anything else to say. I, I was like, who's going first there, right? <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll pipe up. Um, the, um, I think the other area that we generally guide customers and partners is like, Keep it simple, like th focus on some, and I hate to call it quick wins, but I'm going to say like focus on a success. It might not be the ultimate success. It might not solve all problems, but a quick win gets parties engaged across the board, whether they're providers or caregivers or you know someone in the ecosystem. If you can get a quick win that makes you know sense for everyone, then that really gets the enthusiasm and I think the trust going. And so that would be my kind of recap, I guess. Um, and it's still important in this day where there's so many options, right? Mm -hmm. Thanks, that's, Michelle. Yeah, and That's a really good point, Michelle, because once you have that quick win, they're going to want more. And then they're going to ask for more. And what about this or what about that? So, yes, it's that, that low-hanging fruit, you know, that those pain points they're having. For sure. Adam, um, anything to add? No more words of wisdom other than to echo yours, Catherine, that we actually see often that um, some of our, our provider systems we work with didn't realize they have an existing capability embedded mm -hmm. in the tool they have and it had to be turned on, right? And that's great that we can eliminate that for them, but the more we can spread that word of, hey, you might not go have to chase something else. You probably already have it. It's just not, mm -hmm. you're not aware of it or it's not somehow configured correctly or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Back to that education piece. So uh, thank you so much, Adam and Michelle. Appreciate all of your, your thoughts and your wisdom. And with that, Carol, I will turn it back over to you.